So I'll go to the next the next slide, Lana. There's a chart with three three graphs. So this is uh, this is about a year old, but it's um, it's 100% still accurate based on what what happened last year. So it's really just a comparison between companies that pay dividends, the TSX, and companies that don't pay dividends. A little confusion because the dividend non-payers, the uh, the red line. A lot of people looking at this slide assume this is only TSX stocks, but this is all stocks, those that pay dividends, those that don't pay dividends, and then the TSX is just thrown in there for comparison purposes. So, um, so the chart's not trying to pull a fast one on you. It's basically if you look at just the blue chart and the red chart, um, that's the incremental difference you get from owning a dividend company versus a non-dividend company. I'll talk about why this is so in in a couple of slides, but the actual um, compound growth rate. Uh, and it's, it's just absolutely stunning in terms of performance. If you were a fund manager and you could beat an index by this much, you would be an absolute su superhero and you'd be running $100 billion. Um, growth, rate, gro growth ratio of 7.8% for a dividend company versus 2.4% for a non-dividend paying company. So you've got a 5.5% five per, five spread almost um, if you have a dividend. So if I could sell you something that gives you 5.5% more than something else, again, you'd be beating a path to our door trying to invest in that. So that chart is key for any dividend investor. This is all they have to look at if anyone wants to question the, um, the strength of a dividend paying company. So we'll go to the next slide. I'll go through these quick, Lana, so you can just sort of bounce them through as I, as I go. I was just talking about a, couple of, uh, a few companies that have started dividends in the past couple of years. Um, I really tried to find a company, a company that did it in the past five or six weeks, um, and I failed to do so. Maybe I missed something, or maybe I didn't. But um, some of these are six to seven, eight, nine months old. I think one's a couple of maybe even a year and a half old. So Comdev, they announced their first dividend ever uh, about this time last year, almost a year ago exactly. They have a three percent yield right now. It's a company that makes uh, uh, telecommunications products for satellites. Um, and uh, transformers and things like that, all this high-tech stuff. The thing I like about Comdev is they've never had a product fail in space, which of course is kind of important if you're shooting up a satellite um, with a Comdev product on it, you kind of want it to work. And I mention that because they can charge almost whatever they want uh, because it's not about price, it's about reliability. So it's not a bad little company. These are not specifically recommendations, but um, certainly they're all interesting companies. Uh, Pure Technologies, uh, they announced their dividend about nine months ago. The yield's relatively small, but it has the ability to grow. Um, the company uh, has applications that look at infrastructure testing and things like that to see when there's problems at companies or problems at structures primarily. So not a bad little company, but they decided for the first time ever to pay a dividend last year. Axionet Media is involved in uh, developing internet infrastructures for communities. Um, they announced their first dividend again about a year ago today. Western Energy Services um, was two years ago, or a year and a half, a couple of years ago, and a 4.6% yield. Um, maybe because of the oil and gas sector, that may not be as uh, secure as some of the other ones. But again, that goes back to the cyclicality of an industry. If you're in a cyclical industry, you have to give more leeway to a dividend payout ratio, and you have to consider any dividend less safe in a cyclical industry because their destiny is not their own. Um, if you're an oil and gas company and oil goes to $20, it doesn't matter how good you are, you're going to suffer. So we'll go to the next slide, Lana, it's dividend growth examples. Um, I've got two examples here. One is perhaps what we consider at Five by the best run, best example of a company in Canada. And the other one was what I would consider a very decent company. Uh, unfortunately, it's just not here anymore because it got taken over last year. So Water Furnace, Indus Water Furnace Industries, they were involved with um, geothermal. Uh, you stick a pipe in the ground and heat your home much cheaper uh, than regular heating options. It takes about uh, 15 years to get a payback, but um, it was a green, you know, one of those green companies that was trying to save the world by heating homes more efficiently uh, by using the uh, heat from water and heat from the ground. So they started their first dividend 10, just over 10 years ago, seven cents a share. Last year, the start of the year, they had raised that to 25 cents per share. 
and then the company got acquired. So during that period of time when they were raising their stock, their dividend, uh, almost fourfold, their stock went up about the, the equivalent amount. Uh, now it's no longer here. It was taken over last year at thirty dollars and sixty cents. Constellation Software, one of our favorite companies, uh, seven and a half years ago, their first dividend was paid at fifteen cents per share. Their recent dividend was a dollar per share. And look at the stock price. Uh, here's a situation where the dividend is up six and a half times, but the stock is up much more in terms of uh, multiples, from $25 to $337. And the reason why that company is particularly interesting is during that time, even though their dividend's gone up and even though the stock price has gone up and even though their revenue has gone up, they have never issued a single extra share in the past 10 years. And so we always like to mention that because when a company grows without issuing new shares, of course, each individual share is worth more, and you get a, be a better bang for your buck rather than selling shares to somebody else and sh sharing those profits with someone else. You get to keep them yourself with the existing shareholders that were there 10 years ago, and there's no new shares outstanding. It's a, it's a great scenario if you can get it. Um, a lot of companies issue too much stock, and that's a whole other seminar altogether, so we'll skip that. Okay, so I talked about that chart earlier where you get more than 5% outperformance with a dividend stock. And here's five reasons why. There's really there's really more, but these are kind of these kind of nail it. And I'll actually just start from the bottom here. Um, historically dividend stocks outperform. So this is kind of a um, I'm just kind of working that point in because I've just proven it with that chart. But investors know this. Uh, Mutual fund managers know this, pension fund managers know this, and so there's a natural gravitation towards dividend paying stocks because they outperform. And of course that natural gravitation, all that does is further confirm the fact and further support the fact that they're going to outperform in the future. So it's a little bit of a cop out because it says that they outperform because they outperform, but it's exactly true. When you have an investment that is outperforming, you get more attention. When investors worldwide know from a mathematical formula point of view that a dividend stock will outperform, then more money flows into that stock and that, that outperformance continues. So it's much like your own portfolio. When you have a stock that's doubled and a stock that's gone down 50%, which one do you like better? It's pretty easy to, to answer that question unless you're a short seller. Uh, you like the one that's done well better and you're more likely to support that one going forward. So if you, if I'm working my way back up from these points, dividend stocks get better valuations in the market. So it's partly related to that, but just by paying a dividend, your price earnings ratio, your price to cash flow ratio can go up two, three, four, five, six points just by paying a dividend. So now you've got a situation where, and this is why I like the first dividend is you've got a situation where all of a sudden you now have a dividend and all of a sudden you have a better valuation in the market. So you've, you've got two positive investment benefits from, from one corporate action of paying a dividend. So moving up the, the ranks or the points here, and this is probably uh, not discussed as much as it should be, when a company pays a dividend, management now has to come up with the money. They cannot go out and make some crazy acquisition, they cannot pay themselves giant bonuses, um, they cannot do something silly because every three months the, the shareholders have to be paid that dividend. And so it instills a little bit of discipline to management. It's a situation that forces them to consider the cash flow implications of everything they do. And so that dividend is now like, um, it's like an extra set of eyes watching management because it has to be paid once they, I mean, again, it's, it is discretionary, but they sure don't want to cut it. Um, and the management of the company has to make sure they're doing the right thing to make sure that they can keep paying that dividend. So it's a, not talked about, but it's actually quite, a, we talked about dividend stocks outperforming and that draws more money in. We've talked about the fact that uh, dividends in and of themselves get you a better valuation in the stock market. So you get income and a better valuation. So it's a double, double benefit for one action. Uh, management discipline, they have to come up with the cash every three months to pay that dividend. Uh, it ensures that they uh, are focused and make sure they make sure that they have the cash available and actually makes the management team better by having that discipline. Uh, this point number two, dividend stocks are simply more, more stable. 
So we've seen this over the past year or two because there's been quite a few unstable periods in the market. But if you have a stock that pays you 4% and you're pretty sure it's going to stay at 4% or it's not going to change for a while, and you have a stock that pays you nothing and you're worried about the market, which one are you going to sell? 99% of investors will sell the one that doesn't pay the dividend. If you're worried about a market crash, you will say sell the one that doesn't pay a dividend. Um, they're just easier to keep. If you've got that money coming in every three months or every month, uh, it's easier to keep that stock unless you become worried about the sustainability of that dividend. We see this time and time again. Uh, when the market rolls over, those that have cash flow and those that pay dividends are just more stable, more stable than ones that don't. And so it's a situation where even in a giant market collapse, say a 1987 type of scenario, um, dividend support kicks in at a certain period of time. Once a yield level gets to a, a percent of 9 or 10 or 11 percent, then you've got this whole group of investors, uh, dividend investors, that will start looking at these stocks on the way down. Again, this is related to a market event as opposed to a company event, but at a market event level, lots of support comes into these dividend stocks um, as long as they're not at risk of cutting their dividends. So they just become more stable. Everything else keeps falling, and uh, dividend-paying stocks just tend to have a higher floor than everything else. And then dividends prevent you from selling. talked about this a little bit. You just want to keep that money. If you, uh, if you lose your job, you're going to keep the dividends dividend-paying stocks and you're going to sell the other stocks. Um, they just prevent you from selling. It makes you think twice before you sell. So, Lana, we'll go to the next one. Now, here's probably uh, the key things to watch out for. Um, what to watch out for and how to sort of spot some good moves in terms of dividend-paying stocks. One of the best things uh, I've seen in, dividend, in the dividend world is when you get a dividend increase that's conveniently followed by a big market decline. So this is a, a market event, not a company event. So say a company increases their dividend and then there's a problem in the world and everything goes down. Well, the company has just told you that business is good. The company has just told you that they're going to pay you more money and they're confident that they can maintain that new rate of payment going forward. But because of market events, world events, that often gets missed and investors just don't appreciate that dividend increase as much as they should. So this is a oil and gas service company, High Arctic. Uh, may not be the best example because nobody knows where the oil and gas market's going to go. But November 13th, in the middle of the oil collapse, we have an oil service company raise their dividend. Now, the management may be crazy, I can't tell you. Um, but it's a situation where they didn't particularly care about the oil collapse. They can look at their business going forward, and they were quite happy to raise the dividend in the middle of this little oil crisis that we're having. So now the yield is 5.5%. Um, I can't tell you which way High Arctic is going to go, but the situation where the stock itself, has, uh, it was a high of 5.94 in uh, May of this year, and now it's $3.73. So it's gone down more than $2, yet the dividend has gone up during that time. This is a little bit different than a company that has a higher yield just because the price has gone down. This is where they're actually raising their dividend along the way. So it's one thing to watch out for. Um, I'm going to talk about this now. I can't even remember if I have a slide coming up on this. But in, um, in the financial collapse of 2008, all the bank stocks were yielding 10, 11, 12, 13 percent. And none of them cut dividends. Uh, I don't think any of them raised dividends during that period of time. But nobody cut a dividend at all on the bank stocks in Canada, yet as a group, they just collapsed completely, and it's a situation where a market event changed the dividend, not a company event. So it's one thing to watch out for. We talked about this. This is the next slide, Lana. Uh, we talked about the first ever dividend. Again, look for small and mid-cap companies. Don't, don't get a company that starts at too high, and then look at management ownership. This is actually kind of interesting for a lot of people because because of the way dividends are taxed in Canada, if you're a corporate executive and you own half of a small company, you can actually make more after-tax income by paying yourself a lot of dividends instead of a lot of salary uh, because of the cheaper ultimate tax rate that you've got. So if a company has a high insider ownership and they start paying dividends, very, very good sign because what they've basically told you is 
Um, this is assuming they don't pay themselves a lot in salary. Some companies uh, pay their, their executives too much, of course, so you, can, you have to find this on the annual information form to find out how much they're paid. But when a company starts paying high dividends and management owns a lot of stock, you know that management is benefiting from that, that dividend. They're getting money from the company through dividends instead of salary, and you can often join them, buy the stock and get that dividend as well, and you know that that is a key part of their compensation, and so you can invest along with them, and you can almost, there's no guarantees in the stock market, but usually when that happens, uh, the dividend gets increased along the way because the managers want to pay themselves more down the road. Um, so it's a fabulous, fabulous sign to watch out for when there's lots of insider ownership and the dividends start flowing, uh, because once they start flowing, they usually don't stop. So we'll go to the next, the next one, uh, Lana, where it's got the Money Saver banner on the side. Um, so what you also want to watch out for, and we talked about this a little bit, is consistency of dividend increases. Uh, as we mentioned, if a company is increasing their dividend every year, it will get a better valuation than a company that sort of haphazardly increases it based on earnings. Um, slow and steady is the best for dividend increases. Uh, slow and steady in terms of earnings is the best as well, so they kind of go hand in hand. You want a company that has uh, a, a nice stable business that has the ability to keep increasing dividends in all types of economic scenarios and market scenarios. So Fortis has increased their dividend 41 years in a row. So Fortis is a electric utility company, 41 years of dividend in increases. I don't know if they're going to increase their dividend in 2015, but if I were to bet, I would say, yeah, they probably will. Um, it yields 3.5% right now. Um, and because of the way the market went last year, so here we have a boring, boring company. Quite honestly, Fortis is about the most boring company I could probably come up with uh, in a seminar. And um, Fortis went up, let's see, on my Bloomberg, 35% last year. Uh, so if that's boring, give it to me all day long. Uh, so again, it, it highlights the investor value of stability. Um, and so again, when you're buying a stock, ask yourself, how stable is this company? How stable are the dividends? What's the likelihood of a dividend increase? And what is the track record of dividend increases? And if they're all good, then you're onto something something that perhaps will be great, and you might get 35% a year from a boring company. So uh, that can help your portfolio quite a lot. Stantec, um, they started their dividend in 2012. They've increased their dividend twice already since then. Uh, this company has been profitable for 53 years in a row. Uh, they haven't been public that long, but they've been public. Or they've been profitable that long. And uh, just last week, we got a few questions on Stantec because um, the company hasn't done a whole lot recently in the stock market. Um, they, you know, one of our investor uh, customers you know, actually called it boring and said they were bored, bored with Stantec. Um, but the dividend is uh, increased at a 12% rate, 12% annual rate since they started their dividend. Um, the stock did not do that much last year, admittedly. It was down a bit, but on a historical basis, it's been one of the best performing companies uh, on the TSX. So again, it's not always about what happens this year, it's what happens over the next 10 years. So um, we actually still like Stantec quite a lot uh, in terms of its consistency. Uh, any company that can make money for that period of time in a row is not one that we particularly worry about if we go into the next recession or the next, even the next crisis. Uh, they were still making money when things were really, really bad in 08, 09. Auto Canada, is, it's a very volatile stock. Um, there's a lot of speculation about the auto market, of course, and they have, they're buying auto dealerships from, um, from the big manufacturers. But so far they've had 15 consecutive quarterly dividend increases. So again, I don't know if they're going to dividend make a dividend increase this year, but they've done it for the past 15 quarters, and a dividend increase wouldn't surprise me at all from, from that particular company. Uh, it's about a billion dollar market cap, uh, it trades at 18 times price to earnings. Uh, it is quite a ways down from its high. Uh, it was growing very, very fast, and the, the growth rate is slowing down a little bit, and that always scares investors, but, um, but growth is still there, and the dividend growth is still there. So this one might actually transition from a high growth stock to a dividend stock, uh, but again, they're doing it uh, the right way in terms of increasing the dividends. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, more things to look out for. We talked about conservative payout ratio. Um, a lot of people say, what's 
what's a good payout ratio? And we really can't answer that without knowing the company and without knowing the industry. Um, if we look at cash flow, not earnings, you get a, a better indication of the company's ability to pay dividends like we were talking about earlier. You have to look at seasonality, you have to look at cyclicality. Uh, an oil and gas company with a 40% payout ratio is not as good as an industrial company with a 40% ratio and that's not as good as a utility with a 40% ratio. So you really have to look at how much um, corporate profits, corporate cash flow swings around in the company. You also have to look at debt as we talked about before. Uh, if you have a lot of debt then you want a lower payout ratio just to make sure that that debt does not become a problem and just to make sure that your dividend is not cut so that company can pay its debt. So Badger Daylighting, uh, their payout ratio last quarter was 18%. Uh, again, it's in the oil and gas industry, the stock's gone way down, but from a, um, a payout ratio, uh, not particularly worried about that dividend uh, when they've got an 82% cushion versus cash flow from what the dividend is right now. Auto Canada, the one we just talked about, their payout ratio is 50%, so they're cash flow could actually decline by one half and they'd still have the ability to pay their dividend. If it was that bad, I don't know if they would pay their dividend, but um, the cushion is there right now anyway. Next, sign language, or next slide line, it just says good sign. And this is um, perhaps one of the other key points I'd want to make on this seminar. Um, if a company can increase a dividend during a recession, then you're probably on to a good long-term winner. So home capital, uh, I'm just going to pull up some numbers here so I, I don't uh, give you the wrong numbers, but in 2008, 2009, home capital, which is in the mortgage business, providing mortgages to housing. So just think about that for a little bit. You are in the middle of a financial crisis that's caused by the housing market and you have a mortgage company and they raise their dividend in the middle of the financial crisis. So. That's a pretty big statement. Um, perhaps it's like High Arctic raising their uh, their dividend in the middle of the oil crisis that we're currently having. But um, Home Capital in 2008 made a dollar 57 per share in earnings, and then in 2009, uh, in the middle of that crisis, made two dollars and eight cents per share in earnings. So a dollar 57 to 208 in the middle of the worst financial crisis in 55, 60 years. I guess 70 years. Sorry. Um, they managed to increase their earnings by about 30%. And then in 2010, their earnings went from 208 to $2.60. Um, and now for 2015, the estimate is $4.66. So here's a company that made money in a recession, increased their dividends in the recession, and grew their earnings in the recession. So what happens to home capital tomorrow? I couldn't tell you. But if they can survive the financial crisis that well, then it's not one I'm going to worry about tomorrow if, uh, if the market goes down 100, 200 points. TELUS, uh, most people know TELUS is the, um, the phone and uh, cellular company. In 2007, uh, their dividend, or in that period of time from 7 to 2009, they raised their dividend twice. Uh, again, in the middle of the financial crisis, they, their business was fine. They basically said, we like to raise our dividend to reward our shareholders. Their five-year annual dividend growth right now is over uh, almost 10 percent, and in 2008 they made a dollar 69 per share. 2009 they made a dollar 68. So the the big financial crisis cost Telus one cent per share in earnings, um, and this year's forecast is two dollars and 59 cents. So they continue to raise their dividend. Um, they're in a stable industry, on the stocks at 17 times earnings, and they raise their dividend also in November of uh, 2014. So again, it's the consistency you want and basically you have to ask yourself, how much do I need to worry about the stock if things go bad in the economy?